A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The apostles and the brothers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles, too, had accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers confronted him, saying, You entered the house of uncircumcised people and ate with them. Peter began and explained it to them step by step, saying, I was at prayer in the city of Joppa, when in a trance I had a vision, something resembling a large sheet coming down, lowered from the sky by its four corners, and it came to me. Looking intently into it, I observed and saw the four-legged animals of the earth, the wild beasts, the reptiles, and the birds of the sky. I also heard a voice say to me, Get up, people, Peter, slaughter and eat. But I said, Certainly not, sir, because nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time a voice from heaven answered, What God has made clean you are not to call profane. This happened three times and then everything was drawn up again into the sky. Just then, three men appeared at the house where we were, who had been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to accompany them without discriminating. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He related to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house, saying, Send someone to Joppa, and summon Simon, who is called Peter, who will speak words to you by which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as it had upon us at the beginning, and I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift he gave to us when we came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to be able to hinder God? When they heard this, they stopped objecting and glorified God, saying, God has then granted life-giving repentance to the Gentiles too. A thirst is my soul for the living God. A thirst is my soul for the living God. As a hind longs for the running waters, so my soul longs for you, O God. A thirst is my soul for God, the living God. When shall I go and behold the face of God? Send forth your light and your fidelity. They shall lead me on and bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Then will I go into the altar of God, the God of my gladness and joy. Then will I give you thanks upon the harp, O God, my God. Dominus vobiscum, et cum spiritu tuo, 
Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Gloria Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. Verbum Domini as we begin the homily, I would invite you to join me in extending uh, birthday wishes to a dear friend of ours, uh, Mr. Kearns, who celebrates today his 89th birthday. And he is a retired, retired firefighter from New York, a faithful son of St. Francis, who's for many years been a member of the Third Order of St. Francis. And uh, we know Mr. Kearns mostly through his daughter, Jerry, who is a dear friend of the Friars, a member of, a board member of the Archbishop Sheen Foundation, a great advocate and devotee of the Archbishop and keeps us up to date on his progress toward sainthood. But we wish her father, Mr. Kearns, a, a very blessed and happy birthday today. The church is celebrating, or the Franciscan family, I should say, is celebrating today the feast of St. Leopold Mandich, and he is considered a saint of John Paul II. We know that St. John Paul II canonized many saints and brought the sanctity of many to our attention during his pontificate. And early on in his pontificate, St. Leopold is one of uh, the holy men that he elevated to the altars for our uh, veneration. St. Leopold was canonized in the year 1983. He was born on May 12, 1866, and he died on July 30th, 1942. For so, for so, so for some of us, it's not that long ago. For me, it's a long time ago, but I think for a good number of you, you kind of can identify with that year, 1942. Um, and he was a Croatian by nationality, but as a young man, joined the Capuchins of the province of Venice, Italy, and was ordained when he was uh, 24 years old. Now something about St. Leopold that I think we can take to heart is in the media culture that we live in, or I would even dare to say the media crazed culture that we live in. We sometimes make a mistake in thinking that sanctity depends on how we look, or how we sound or how we're perceived by others. You know, we think that in order to be a holy priest, you have to look like Bing Crosby, who says, you know, dial O for O'Malley, you know, and is able to break into song at any moment. Oh, the bells of St. Mary. How many priests do you know that can really sing like that? Most of us are like, the Lord be with you. You know, we can barely get it out sometimes. And we don't look like Bing Crosby, the vast majority of us. We certainly don't look like whoever that actor was in Alfred Hitchcock's uh, I Confess, you know, this young priest coming along. 
But we can make this mistake, even young men in the seminary and religious life, that it's how we look, you know, that we look like the statue, or we look like the holy card that somebody sketched, or the nun that's really perfectly holy, that really such a perfect sister looks like Ingrid Bergman. That's not reality. And Saint Leopold is a perfect witness of this for us. He was born physically malformed, and they say that he was delicate in his health. We know that in reality because he wanted so badly in his life to return to his own people to preach the gospel. He wanted at one point to be sent to the Orient to preach. And his superiors always denied that request because they knew he was not capable of that with his health. And because of this being malformed, he was very short. He was only four foot five. And he walked with a clumsy walk. And he was afflicted with stuttering. Now, this is a man who became extremely holy and who many people came to go to confession to him for nearly 36, 38 years, he was in Padua. Now, what do you think of when you hear Padua, this big, beautiful basilica of St. Anthony? And you should think of that. Let me remind you, you should think of St. Anthony when you hear of Padua. But in that same town is this little teeny tiny Capuchin church where you go to visit where St. Leopold lived. And during World War II, uh, that part of that monastery or friary had been destroyed by a bomb. But St. Leopold had predicted that his, where his confessional was would not be destroyed. And that was true. It did not get destroyed. You can still see where he heard the confessions of so many who came to him through, through the course of almost 40 years. And you can sit there where he would hear confessions. Uh, in his time, they, it was nearby the entrance of the friary. And we're told that the fabric that was used to make the rough Capuchin habit that St. Leopold wore was, it almost sounds like it was some kind of new invention of polyester or something, but it didn't breathe well. And in the winter, he was freezing. And in the summer, he was melting. And nobody knew that. But there he would sit in that confessional and receive soul after soul after soul. He's called an apostle of confession. He's a great witness held out to us as priests of one who would dedicate himself to spend those hours listening to the sins of those who are seeking after God. Now, how many of us would go to a priest and think, well, he's really holy when he's stuttering. Well, no, 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 no. He's got to have this deep baritone voice and speaks very perfectly. It's not who God used. He's not tall enough to hear my confession. And he kind of walks around. He's limping as he walks. This is who the Lord uses. Uh, if we look at St. Francis, so many times we look at the statues of St. Francis. This is someone that St. Leopold emulated. St. Francis is always depicted for us as this just, just like, handsome, handsome man. You know, a perfect beard. You know, this hair that uh, was cropped, you know, chopped here. The, uh, just, just excellent. Well, he didn't look like that. If you look at the painting that they say is the closest depiction of St. Francis, he was a very homely-looking man. And that's what the biographers say. He wasn't the most handsome of individuals. And he himself was short. But to show, even in the time of St. Francis, how we as human beings fall prey to appearances, Brother Maceo, one of the companions of St. Francis, was handsome. And so when they would send the brothers out, the friars would go door to door begging for food, just whatever you have left over with this little dish, and people would throw the scraps of their table in this bowl for the friars to eat. 
guess who always came back with more? Not St. Francis, Brother Maceo. Why? Because people naturally were inclined to give this one who was better looking more. And St. Francis identified that. Same thing is true today. We know that even as religious, a big difference between men and women religious. You know, Father Benedict Rochelle told us this when we were young friars, that you send the sisters out to the farmer's market because everyone always looks at a nun and says, Sister, what do you need? You know, I'll help you, no problem. And they look at a friar, and they don't say it, but the thought in the back of their mind is, get a job. You know, you got to work for what you're getting. St. Anthony, Mother Angelica, I always cringed when Mother Angelica would tell us this, but St. Anthony, if I could just use the word chubby, <laughs> he was a rotund man. He was a large man. And I remember Mother Angelica as a novice. I just received the name Anthony, was reading about him in the saint books, you know, had the holy cards where he just looked you know, caught up in the God. And Mother Angelica is saying he's this obese man. And she said everybody always says that he had a glandular problem. She said he liked food. You know, what was wrong with that? Now, maybe that was a weakness of this man that we hold out as a great saint. St. Leopold lived in the town where St. Anthony was known and preached, and where his, this great basilica was built in his honor. You know, they say about Padre Pio, uh, he didn't never reveal the great orthodontic work that was done for him. He was crabby. You know, you try to have the stigmata for that many years. And you see pictures, you see video of him now. He's kind of, he wasn't a, a bad person, obviously he's a saint. But he's a little bit grouchy. And sometimes he looked kind of, uh, you know, he did kind of make this Italian motion at the friars when they were making too big of a fuss. I must say, in, out of respect for St. Clair, we do know that she was tall and that she was very elegant and that she was beautiful. So for those of you who are attractive, the Lord can call you but most often he calls the dumpy, ugly ones. <laughs> because isn't that who most of us are? Aren't most of us just plain, ordinary, plotchy old people? And don't confuse this, don't get caught up in this idea that sanctity is in the appearance. That sanctity isn't how we look. Sanctity isn't how we sound. Sanctity is in our heart. Sanctity is in our love for God. Sanctity is in our love for our brother and sister. You know, how united are we to the Lord? This is how St. Leopold was known. His brother, Capuchins, criticized him for being too gentle to penitents who would come to him for confession. Now, tons of people came to him probably because he did give an easy penance. But they also said he was very compassionate. He was a man who understood the weaknesses of those who were coming to him confessing their sins. He was not a harsh confessor. And so he was criticized for being too gentle or being too soft. But he himself said, I give my penitence only small penances because I do the rest myself. And then he said about a priest, and this is very uh, convicting for any of us called to holy orders, he said a priest must die from apostolic hard work. There is no other death worthy of a priest. This is the type of man who is serving the Lord. And for 36 years sitting there in Padua, Again, most of us are going to say, we want to be recognized. No, make me a superior. Give me a position. Send me somewhere. Let me be transferred. Let me do something great. For that many years, day in and day out, he did the same thing. 
We're told that he was very dedicated to our Blessed Mother. He would have lived after the time that Our Lady appeared in Fatima, who, who we'll honor tomorrow. But he prayed the rosary every day. What did Our Lady tell us at Fatima? Pray the rosary every day. What did this little man do? He prayed the rosary every day. What do you suppose we should do? Pray the rosary every day. We have pictures of him who he went with the group on pilgrimage uh, to Lourdes. Many of us have had the opportunity to be there. We can identify with this little Capuchin priest who went there to honor our Blessed Mother. He desired deeply the unity between the Catholic and Orthodox churches, and he prayed for this every day. And so he's also called an Apostle of Unity. He's known as the Apostle of Confession and the Apostle of Unity. But we're told that in his deep devotion to the Virgin Mary, he would refer to her as my holy boss. That's how he called Our Lady. Now, he was, wanted to be the perfect disciple of Mary, and whatever she commanded, he wanted to do. In addition to praying the rosary each day, we're told that he celebrated the Eucharist almost every day at the side altar in honor of our Blessed Mother. And then he would go to visit the sick. After he offered Mass in the morning, he would visit the sick in their homes all over the city of Padua, and he would visit his brother Capuchins in the infirmary to give them comfort, to give them a word of counsel, and to remind them not to lose the faith, but to be persevering. And we're told this beautiful thing about the way he died. Here he was devoted to our Blessed Mother all of his life. And on July 30th, 1942, he was 76 years old. He was dying from cancer of the esophagus. But he went in to prepare for Mass, and he collapsed on the floor of the sacristy. And the friars carried him to his cell, and they began to do what a religious community does around the deathbed of one of their brothers who is dying. They invoke the saints and they pray for this soul who's passing in to the hands of God. And they entrusted him to our Blessed Mother. They began to chant the Salve Regina, the prayer, the Hail Holy Queen. And as they got to the end of that, in the words that we're so familiar with, O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, they noticed that their brother Leopold had passed away. Now we can say, what did he accomplish in his life? Seemingly nothing. But he was this humble little man who gave himself completely at the disposal of God, day in and day out, loving his blessed mother, and he attained great sanctity and is a model and witness of, uh, for us of God's mercy and of the faithful living of the priesthood. And so we honor him today and ask for his intercession.